And welcome back to some sort of the Cooler Jets podcast where it was Ben Blessington and Michael Nanya. Well, Michael, uh, big episode today. We're going to have Thomas Morstead on the show. That'll be in about 15 minutes, but we wanted to just touch on the Jets' free agency moves as of now. We'll obviously have a much uh, bigger podcast uh, in a couple days to, to really review all their moves. But we're, there's still some big fish out there. You know, the Jets could go and sign a Tyron Smith or Mike Williams or Tyler Boyd, or maybe they've already done something like that by the time you're listening to this. So we don't want to spend too much time on it because we do have more stuff coming on, and that's the main point of this interview. But we figured it's, it's Friday morning. Um, might as well just touch on some of the signings the Jets have, have made this week. Um, but first, Michael, I'll just ask you very quickly, how are you doing, man? Good. Let's talk about free agency. <laughs> okay, he's all business today. Um, <laughs> it seems like Jets Nation is mostly – most have been pretty mad about this free agents. I mean, it's every year it's like this. Like it, it kicks off legal tampering, nothing happens, everybody freaks out, and the Jets make literally they just have to make one move. The player doesn't really even have to be that good, but as soon as they sign somebody, fans are like ooh, and they get all excited and they start tweeting about him and looking him up. And that was kind of the case with the John Simpson, uh, Tyrod Taylor, Javon Kinlaw night. That was night one. Um, people started to get excited again, and then Tuesday, people were like, wait a second, they gave Javon Kinlaw seven million dollars. What the hell? They had still hadn't done anything. And then uh, I think they signed another defensive tackle, did nothing. A few players were off the board. I saw people getting angry again. And then Wednesday, the Jets make a move for Morgan Moses, who they did let walk out the building a couple of years ago, but get him back on a very reasonable deal. He's a starting level right tackle. That was a great move, and that brought the move back up. But then since then, Michael, nothing has really happened, and therefore Jets fans are pretty pissed again. So maybe by the time you're listening to it, you'll have caught Jets fans on the uptick. Maybe they'll have made a, a signing that'll – It'll make people happy. Uh, I'll just start very broad here. What are your thoughts on on the on the Jets' plan so far? The first couple of days of free agency. Well, yeah, like you said, I mean, I think everyone gets very emotional and they re- overreact to things once once free agency gets underway. And I'm trying not to fall into that pit too much, although I think I have a little bit because sometimes I catch myself. I'm like, what is my plan? Because I feel like my plan has changed. 10 times, you know, pre free agency, I was like, let's, let's go low at wide receiver. Now I'm like, why aren't you getting Keenan Allen and Deontay Johnson? <laughs> so I'm trying not to, you know, make too many strong takes before, you know, seeing how it all plays out. Because like you said, like felt like the end of the world. Then you're like, okay, Simpson, like Tyra Moses. All right. Now I'm starting to see what's going on. So I'm trying not to get into it, you know, on, on an overarching level too much before we really see how it, all comes together at the end but at the same time i still think you can analyze the signings they made and then discuss you know some of the moves that weren't made you know could that have made sense for the jets Uh, i think you can still do that so um overall i think the foundation is set for this to be a very strong offseason if they can check a few more boxes at the same time i am a little concerned whether those boxes will be checked based on some of the options that have gone off the board at this point, you know, specifically looking at the receivers. There've been a lot of, um, you know, big name talents who I think got traded for a lot less than I expected. They may have been traded for then offensive line was always not the strongest market, but a lot of those options are gone as as well. So um, I I think this can still end up being the off season. We all want to see. It's just, as we sit here right now, there's uncertainty as to what are they going to try to do to make that happen? Yeah, I mean, we'll have a, a more in-depth pod on this, but I'll just quickly go through each guy. John Simpson, left guard from the Ravens. Uh, his, his signing and Morgan Moses, you had, a, you had a fantastic article. I recommend everybody check it out. But it's it, it points to the Jets making a, a schematic change um, with with their offensive, uh, with their running scheme. And so definitely go check that out on, on Jets X Factor. So what do you think? We'll start with John Simpson, uh, and I guess we can lump Morgan Moses in there as well. Two guys from Baltimore. Um, and the Jets to do it in a way where they're not spending too much money, but I really do feel like those two moves could really ultimately make this Jets offensive line uh, a lot more violent, a lot more physical. Um, I'm excited about some of those changes. They still need to figure out left tackle, but just those two right there make me feel a hell of a lot better about this line. So what do you think? We can start with Simpson and then, and then get to Moses. Yeah, I'm a big fan of these two moves, and, and this is why I feel – uh, relatively optimistic right now is because if they could, you know, address the other things they have going on, this right here was the crux of the off season. How are they going to address the offensive line? And with these two moves, I really like the direction they're going. And I'm not going to lie. These, 
they weren't on neither of these players were on my radar going into the offseason. I don't think they were on anyone's radar. So it it was outside always of the box, happens. which always happens. Like we kind of pick like we think we know exactly how it's going to go. A small handful of guys, and then they go completely out in a different direction. Same but, with the um, draft. Same thing with the draft. We're drafting a, a safety in the first round. No, please don't do that. But yeah, Simpson, like I was aware of Simpson, but I didn't really consider him too much because, you know, I, it was a much different scheme in Baltimore. He kind of came out of nowhere. He was a reserve future signing just a year ago after he got cut by the Raiders, joined the Ravens. So I didn't really look into him too much because he didn't seem like someone who they'd target, but they get him on a good deal. And I look into him more. He's got good pass blocking numbers. He's young. He's durable. And his his film was really impressive. And if you don't trust me, Joe Blue had also watched it. And he was relatively impressed as well. Um, it was just the only question when they got him was, okay, what scheme fit? Because he's coming from a you know downhill, gap blocking, power offense in Baltimore. That's not really what the Jets run. They do some of those things sometimes, but it's mostly zone with Hackett. But then they go out and they trade for Morgan Moses. And that's something that I think we've mentioned is, you know, maybe there's an outside the box tackle trade because the tackle free agent market was so weak. Could they potentially trade for someone we're not talking about? And then that's what they go out and do with Moses. Now you get two guys from the same offense. To me, that sends a, a message. We're trying to do something totally different with the scheme, with the mentality, of this offensive line. We want to be a power team. We want to go downhill. We're going to pull guys. We're going to run duo. We're going to run between the tackles. That's the vision I think they're trying to build. And I like it because it seems like they are being adaptable, changing off of things that haven't worked for them in the past. Uh, It feels like they're establishing a more aggressive kind of nasty mentality with that type of scheme. I think Joe Tittman and AVT fit it really well because they're both good pullers. They both have nasty to them when they get the opportunity to show it. They're good down blockers which is also key. So I really like the direction the offensive line is going. And I think those two guys are not just, um, they're good players, but you got them at good contracts too. I don't feel like you just got, like, I feel like both of them are better than what their contract numbers are. I don't feel like, okay, the Jets got two just good enough guys at, you know, five, six million, whatever they both cost. I really feel like they're going to outperform that, especially if they make this scheme adjustment uh, to fit, to those two players. So I really like the offensive line moves to start off free agency. I agree with you there. Um, left tackle, obviously up in the air. There's David Bakhtiari is the Rogers best friend who look, I mean, he's only played 13 games in, in three years, but when he's healthy, he's one of the best left tackles in football, but you can't rely on that. He's going to be healthy after multiple knee surgeries. Um, so, but it's possible that at this point they could, Sign Bakhtiari, still take a tackle at 10, and then you're in a good position because if Bakhtiari goes down, you have the rookie. Um, also, Tyron Smith's out there. Maybe they go and just sign Tyron, who has his own injury issues, but slightly more durable than Bakhtiari. Maybe they sign both of them. Um, so who knows how they're going to fill that that left tackle need. And if they do, maybe a receiver in the draft becomes more of an option. Um, and it's something I think we've all been kind of penciling in. They're going to take a tackle at 10. They're going to take a tackle. It's like, well, if they – if they do plug that hole, I think it opens up their options um, in the draft. And then at receiver, it's like Mike Williams is, is the big fish remaining. I do think they're going to be in on Mike Williams. I just don't know how expensive they're going to go for him. They didn't want to trade for Keenan Allen because of that $18 million salary. Williams has his own injury issues. Although, as you pointed out, I mean, he was averaging playing like 15 games a year um, for, for a really consistent stretch here. But he did tear yeah. his ACL week three. Um, but he's a great receiver. I think he'd be a, a, a great complimentary piece to Garrett Wilson um, because he's he's so good at those contest, contested catches and and getting down the field too. I mean, I think he we really talked about how the Jets need somebody who can who can stretch the field, and that can be Mike Williams. Um, so I think the Jets are going to be in in on Mike Williams. It's just if it turns into a big bidding war, I could see them walking away from it. Um, so that's kind of what I have my eye on. I mean, there's obviously Tyler Boyd is out there. He's interesting as a, as a slot receiver um, from from Cincinnati. Although he's, he's a little bit bigger, so I don't know if he necessarily has to be pegged in as as a slot receiver. But that's what he played in Cincy. Um, I mean, Josh Reynolds, Corey Davis is is back, and but the Jets cut him to to maybe bring him back on a cheaper deal, or he'll sign elsewhere. So there's a few options there. Um, but obviously, the, the big fish at either tackle or receiver, it's Tyron Williams and Mike Williams. So we'll, we'll close Ty, Ty, Tyron Smith. And, or Mike Williams. 
So we'll close with this. Obviously, a couple days we'll have a podcast. We'll dive into these guys a little bit deeper. We'll uh, we'll look at the Jets for agency approach as a whole. But we're going to give them a couple more days. But I'll just ask you this, Michael. By Sunday, all right, by Sunday night, is either Tyron Smith or Mike Williams a New York Jet? No. Do, the Jets don't get either. Based on the signs that we're getting from the reports, speculation, all that, it just, it just doesn't feel like they're in the market for that move. And, and that's probably my main criticism right now is, like, look, if, if they get Corey Davis and, you know, pair him with Tyler Boyd or OBJ, Josh Reynolds, take your pick. Like, that's a nice wide receiver unit. Garrett Wilson, Corey Davis, who I love with Aaron Rodgers, I think is underrated in general. And then you get another solid guy in there. Like, that's a solid unit, and I won't complain about that. But at the same time, it just feels like the Jets with – 40-year-old quarterback, all the restructures they've done in recent years, and just the overall window that they've kind of crafted here. It's about right now, and it really feels like they should be trying to get a move in there that signals that sort of mentality. And so so it would be okay if, like, I get it. They have a lot of holes to fill. They don't have the most cap space. So if they want to do the whole thing economically with no big splashes involved, I understand, and they could still be a good team, but I would – like to see and i think they have the ability to if they want to do it through restructures trades whatever to fit one of these moves in there and really send the message like we're going for it and we want to win this thing right now i think they have the ability to do that so i would like i think those are the two guys that fit that bill right now either get tyron smith and really solidify this offensive line as okay we got a really strong offensive line going into this year or get mike williams and then him and garrett wilson like that's a very strong receiver duo that could go toe to toe with anyone. So I would love to see them make one of those two moves, but just doesn't feel like they are to well, me. Well, we'll see. Uh, hey, we'll see. CJ Mosley did restructure his deal on a little extension. Yeah. He took took one for the team, took a pay cut. I mean, he's uh, it started off as maybe one of the worst contracts in Jets, Jets history, and I won't go as far to say it's one of the best because it still was quite the overpay at the time. But he's turned into a damn good player, and I, I think one that I hopefully retires as a Jet. I mean, he's. He'll be a Jet longer than he was a Raven, which is which is just crazy to think about. But um, all right, let's get into Morstead. Um, we will have a podcast probably Monday morning is what I would would imagine. Um, just talking about all these moves more in depth. But we want to get to Thomas Morstead. Very excited that the Jets. I mean, that was really the the big move is re-signing Thomas Morstead, re-signing Greg Zerline, bringing back the special teams duo that was just so good for the Jets and what honestly felt felt like a wasted season for them. I mean, if they had gotten that performance you know, on a team that was in playoff games and, and um, playing meaningful football, I think he would have noticed it a little bit more, especially Zerline, who was unbelievable. And I actually looked at his numbers and the amount of clutch kicks that he was hitting and Morstead. I mean, he, I think he got a lot of praise just because he was on the field a lot, but pinning teams inside the 10 constantly. Um, so both of them, glad to have him back. And Morstead, he's been on the show a couple of times. We're going to have one again uh, plenty of times over the next two years, hopefully. Um, all right, so without further ado, Thomas Morstead. And welcome back to some sort of the Cool Your Jets podcast where it was Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. We're here, longtime friend of the pod. Thomas, I think we can say that now. We've had you on a couple of times now. But as I said to you when you first got on, the $5 million man, Thomas Morstead, re-signing with the New York Jets. It was it was a top – I think Aaron Rodgers said it himself when he was asked about what the Jets need to do this offseason. I think he mentioned your name first and re-signing you and Greg Zerline. So I'm glad the Jets – Got that out of the way. As soon as free agency officially started, you re-signed with the Jets. So first, how are you doing, man? How does it feel? It feels damn good. Um, it's been a long journey the last three years. I uh, uh, felt like I was the punter of the decade in the 2010s. And and um, to have my injury in 2020, couldn't get a workout with any team um, in the offseason of 21 and, and then just – randomly get an opportunity week two with the Jets and do really well, but still get released and leave on good terms with everybody for this to kind of full circle all the way back and be a part of last year's team and feel like I'm still ascending as the old guy in the league now. Um, has been a really special journey and uh, super rewarding for sure. What was what was the process of re-signing like? Because, I mean, it was seemed like a foregone conclusion you were going to come back to New York. <laughs> just with the way everybody was talking about it, and obviously the season that you had. But, you know, so I'll be honest, when it when it didn't get done before legal tampering and then the legal tampering, it still wasn't happening. You put out that tweet that quelled any sort of nerves, but there was the voice in the back of my head. I was like, well, he had a really good season. Maybe somebody's really 
you know, going to try to, to, you know, could box out the Jets here? Like, what was kind of the, the process of resigning with, with New York? Well, number one, I, I couldn't extend early because um, I was on a VSB deal last year. So I, I, I legally could not do an extension. Um, so that was what kind of made it a little unique. Um, yeah, I, I mean, nothing's ever a foregone conclusion, right? I mean, um, as much as I thought I would be back and was hoping to be back, um, you know, you go through this tampering period and teams call you and, you know, want to gauge your interest. So, I mean, that happened. Uh, but I think the whole time, I mean, I was fairly confident, like I would end, end up back with the Jets. And, um, and that's what happened. So I'm super excited about it. Yeah, and the fan base is glad to have you back. I know the team is. And it sounds like you are as well. What would you say is your favorite thing about being a Jet and, you know, just being in New York with the Jets in particular? What's something that stands out the most about playing for this particular franchise, fan base, and in this market? Um, You know, it's different, but it reminds me a little bit of New Orleans. Kind of this, um, you know, a little more blue-collar, a um, little rowdier, a little drunker. Uh, fan base, you know, some boobers, a little, little more fanatic, uh, you know, people that kind of feel they've been slighted or, or, you know, viewed as the little brother a little bit. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I kind of sense some similarities there and there's a lot of differences as well, but I kind of feel that sort of same sort of fan sentiment, um, kind of like, uh, I don't know, just kind of. Had a like rough a chip history. on our shoulder, just <laughs> yeah, chip on the shoulder, yeah. a little bit of a rough history. Um, and so that's hard, you know. That the I, I people kind of give me a hard time for always going back to Saints, but I mean, I live in New Orleans and played here for forever. And, um, you know, it's before Drew Brees and Sean Payton got there, they were like, like didn't have a great history, and and so it's just hard to sometimes get over that trauma and the scars. And I can feel that from some of the Jets fans, yeah. Um, but man, they love their team. And I've felt nothing but love and appreciation from all the fans. And um, so, you know, I'm grateful for that. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's all about, to me, it's all about the guys that you spend your time with every day and those relationships and, and trying to do something special and something that nobody thinks you can do. Um, that's what's fun. So um, really enjoyed the locker room. Uh, I know I'm not into moral victories and I'm not saying we had one last year, but um Last year was a really – lots of tough circumstances, things that didn't go our way. Um, and I'm proud of the group that the way we hung in there. Uh, I never really feel, experienced the uh, the New York media like I did last year. Yeah. And I'd always heard about it. And, and you know, it's it's a lot. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's an extra um, – it's an extra – resistance that you have to fight through to win here that I, that I didn't ever really appreciate until being here. Um, and so it's definitely something that even when we won games against some good teams early in the season, then the articles would come out about so-and-so not being happy with playing time. I mean, it was all divisive yeah. all the time. And so I'm not saying that's from you guys, but it's the, the big, the big, big media. They're just trying to, you know, stir the pot. And so feeling that you got to resist it. You got to have a really strong group of guys that can, hang together and, and avoid the distractions. So, well, yeah, I mean, quickly, because like we could talk about 2023 for a second here, just because obviously, I mean, it, personally, it felt like a great year for you. You had a lot of, you got a lot of praise. You were on the field a lot and you had some really good games. You got, you got brought out of the tunnel introduced, which I'm sure was, a was a great moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously that seemed as a fan, that was the hardest season I think I've, I've had to endure. <laughs> so I can't imagine actually being a player, just being there week one with all that excitement. And then, just watching the injury. I mean, obviously they still won week one. So that was great, but that whole season was just a nightmare from a fan's perspective. And, you know, it's, it's tough to gauge because we're not in the locker room, but how do you felt, how do you feel the team handled the season? Because it, it seemed like the first half of the season you guys were there and then it, it just started to to get away from you. Um, just kind of what are your like parting shots on, on 2023, obviously 2024 is supposed to be a lot different, but how do you feel at, the yeah, season wrapped I, up. I think those are reasonable feelings. Um, you know, I kind of define the, the, the difference between your expectations and what happens positive or negative is kind of like happiness level. So if expectations were here and then we did that, I can see that why that was like a 
tremendously different, <laughs> difficult season for fans, right? Same for players. Um, and so that reality is why I'm proud to have been a part of the team because it was so hard. It was so difficult and guys kept fighting. I mean, guys, get, we were getting bashed for trying to win games at the end of the season. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. hey, you guys want us to be winners. Winners don't try to lose. You know what I mean? And so, uh, and so Michael. you know, I was, pr- I was, I was proud to be part of the group and, uh, you know, um, you know, every year it takes on a life of its own. You just never know how it's going to go. Right. And so, uh, but that's also what makes it, makes it exciting. Um, every team starts O O the next year. It's a, it's a reboot, a refresh, new group of guys. And, uh, I'm just glad to be a part of it. Yeah. And speaking of trying to take that next step, like you said, trying to do something, no one thinks you guys can do, or we do, but people outside of Jets <laughs> land. What is the key to doing that outside of Achilles staying intact? What do you think is the key for this group to get over the hump this year? Look, if, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be making a lot more money. Um, so, it, you know, it's hard. You know, it's it's everybody pulling in the same direction. It's um, it's guys going above and beyond to invest in each other, get to know your teammates, uh, help rookies be not not be rookies very quickly, right? Um, and just getting everybody everybody's aiming in the same direction, um, and that just takes time. It's an investment, right? And and all the returns in life come from compounding interest, and you just got to keep you got to keep investing constantly in yourself and each other, and you almost have to have an unrational optimism that you're going to be able to get it done, and so. Um, you know, I like the locker room we have, um, and you know, I'm I'm excited to get to know some of the new guys. Um, but you know, every year it's just exciting because you don't know what's coming, and um, it's just fun to be a part of. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what moves the Jets make. They've made a few so far, and obviously a lot, a lot more to come, and and the draft, and so the locker room will look a little bit different. A lot of the coaching staff is is still intact, and uh, I'm just excited to finally. It feels like 2023 we were robbed of, at the very least, just getting to watch Aaron Rodgers as the Jets quarterback. But I think the season would have, I mean, most people would, would agree, the season would have looked a lot different if we got to see even just half a season of, of A-Rod at, at QB. So I'm excited to finally get to see what we all thought we were getting a year um, a, a year ago. Um, so I, I just want to close a couple, a couple just easier questions, fun questions before we get out of here. First, I want to ask you, um, what is, I think we talked about this the first time you're on the podcast, but the off season training regimen, because I think the first podcast I was like, are you just squatting and deadlifting all the time? But I realized it's like, as a professional athlete, like, is it more just like functional training? Are you worried about getting injured in the weight room? Like how does, how does your off season training regimen look like? Well, um, yeah, I really don't stay out of the gym. Um, I, I mean, my big difference in the off season is I just don't kick a ball for, three or four months. Um, I don't know. I kind of equate it to a pitcher, like giving their shoulder, their arms some time to rest. Um, so I just kind of stay away from that, but everything else is, um, I'm always training in the gym. Um, I try to do some interval treadmill sprints at least twice, if not three days a week. I think, um, running on the treadmill has been really good for me. I started doing that two years ago and I feel like, um, I don't know. My body just feels better when I'm doing it. But it's, uh, I mean, I'll be lifting weights when I'm 70. Like, it's just what I do. I love I love being in the weight room. It's it's a hobby. And so, um, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons I'm still playing and uh, just keeping my body right and, um, and, and, and really loving being in the weight room and constantly testing myself and trying to get stronger and more efficient. And, and um, you know, it's just a fun thing. You're, you're, it's like you're just constantly uh, tweaking and, kind of like bodybuilding for athletics i guess you know what i mean you're just you're just trying to always you know i i I always uh read the bodybuilding magazines when i was growing up and hearing arnold talk about like you know if your shoulders aren't there you got to add a little more clay there you know you got to put some more time in there and so i'm always trying to just identify like weak links in my in my uh in my body and just try to get them up to par and um you know people are like why are you benching all that or why you doing all these weighted pull-ups and i'm like if your bot a stronger body is going to equate to better output even if it's not directly tied to it and so it's just something i'm interested in i love doing it and i think it's a good example for young guys to see why is this gray-haired old man getting paid by a team to keep playing football in the nfl um it's hopefully can be a good light on you know i don't i don't know many old guys that don't live in the weight room um that are still playing so hopefully try to be a good mentor and 
help the young guys come along a little bit. Yeah, but it's a little bit of like use it or lose it. I mean, that's that seems like that's the message it. there. Does does the team give you like a, a a diet or a weight regimen at all, or is it all on you? And how does it happen when you go back to the facility? Are you then on their program? Like, yeah. So um, you know, one of the things that's I would say a big positive for me is the, uh, the strength staff. Uh, Coach Nicolini is the bomb. Um, you know, he is he is. He has studied up. He's always learning. You know, he's not one of these old school guys that's always done it this one way and just the way he does it. Like he's always trying to get better and he's always learning how to put us in better position to be stronger, train smarter, be more efficient. And uh, he's really been a really nice ally for me as far as just, you know, not just kind of coming in and putting the hammer down on me and saying this is the way we do it. It's like we've really worked together what does the program look like? And he's tailored some of the things for me, or he changes the days that I do different things on, uh, on during the season with my kick schedule. And so, um, you know, that's a, if I'm not typically one of my best friends at every team is the strength coach. Um, so, um, that's a red flag if it's not. So, um, yeah, we get along great. And then as far as the diet stuff, you know, the, the food at the jets facility is phenomenal. Um, just not the I saw we got, I saw that we got a C, a C grade on the food. And I was like, I don't know what guys are thinking there. Cause like, I don't know. I feel like the food is phenomenal. Um, it's obvious to me that the team has prioritized that. So I don't know if they had bad lunch that day when we got the chance to like make the grades or something, but. Um, so you're I saying, you're the, saying the survey's fake news. Is that, I'm is not that saying it's fake. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm saying I'm saying the people that took the survey on the team last year must have not not liked what we had for breakfast or lunch that day because um, I it's I love that and the travel uh, we got to see on the travel we all fly, fly first class so I, I don't I don't <laughs> understand like how that's a C um, so anyways you know it is what it is I don't I you know it's it's I know that they do a legitimate process and the NFLPA does a great job with there's been a lot of positive changes throughout the whole league with different uh, teams, you know, investing in some different resources, but how we got C's in both of those areas, I'm not sure. Cause I, I, you know, it's been about as good as I've been around. So, um, so anyways, that was a sidetrack answer. No, I, <laughs> I'm actually fascinated by that. Um, all right. We have two more questions here. I'll make them, we'll make them fast quick. Yeah, sure. Um, besides Greg's airline, who also deserves a shout out for, for getting resigned. I'm glad both of you, staying intact uh who do you think would be the best punter on the team if it, if you went down and Zerline went down same game somebody has to punt who's who do you think steps in Ooh, Al well, Lazard I'll tell you who would be a unique one would be uh Garrett Wilson I've seen uh-huh. him kick and punt a ball but you know it'd be like one of these like scat backs you know you could snap in the ball are we gonna fake it are we actually gonna punt it but he could actually thump his leg into it pretty good um, she could do some different stuff with him. And then, uh, you know, our, uh, our rookie tight end, big, tall guy. He, oh, Zach I've Koontz. Seen him, yeah. Koontz. I've seen him. I've seen him, uh, put his foot into a ball. I think he punted in high school and I told him not to practice too much because I don't want to <laughs> lose my job. Uh, he, he looks like the prototype. So, uh, maybe he'd be the guy if we, if we were for sure, you know, it was fourth and 20 and everybody knew we were punting. Maybe he'd be the guy. That's that's one for me. I saw I saw a couple hours ago you posted a little poll looking for some advice on your New Jersey number this year. Speaking of Garrett Wilson, he's going to be taking your number, it looks like. Uh, so which yep. one are you leaning towards? You put three, six, 15 on here. I voted for six, you know, throw back to the Super Bowl. And I also think it looks the best out of these three. But do you yep. have an early preference? Um, yeah, I I, um, I think I'm leaning six, but um We'll see. I thought I'd have a little fun with the fans first on social and just see what they thought. And really the kids are going to get to make the final, final call. I think they've, they picked number four, um, you know, three years ago. And, um, cause there were four of them. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we picked number five last year because they wanted us to have a baby. So, well, so now, now you have to, if you pick six, do you know what that means? That, that means we need to have twins, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we'll see. We'll uh, see. Thomas, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your day. Um, again, congratulations. Uh, really happy for you. Excited to see competent special teams for the Jets for at least the next two years. 
Um, but can't thank you enough for, for doing this. And we'll, we'll definitely have you on again soon, but, uh, but go enjoy the time with your family. That video with your, your, that your family celebrating was, was awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me on. Um, excited to be back. All right. See you, man. Thanks so much. See Thomas. Bye guys. All right. That was Thomas Morstead coming back to the jets for two more years. Thanks so much to Thomas for coming on and we'll be back at some point in the next few days with a more thorough recap of free agency, our thoughts on all the signings, how they fit with the team, the value of the contracts and all of that. Just, Right now, we only want to briefly skim over it because it just feels like something is going to happen at some point. A big signing is going to drop that's really going to complete this offseason because I I don't want to be too critical of it right now because I don't want to sit here and, you know, make all these criticisms of you're being too complacent in this area or that area. And then news comes out that they get Tyron Smith or Mike Williams or they do whatever they do. And then now my criticism makes no sense because I was impatient trying to get some news to react to. So I don't want to get too deep into my thoughts just yet. So we're going to wait a couple more days, let the dust settle just a bit. But um, yeah, that was Thomas Morstead. We gave you some preliminary thoughts on free agency, but uh, thanks so much for listening. And we'll be back soon with more complete thoughts on free agency.